Suppose you just identified that there's a serine protease as an important biological target for therapeutic applications that needs to be inhibited. The first thing you'd want to do, and what we're going to do in this webcast, is understand the molecular mechanism of the normal mode of action of that enzyme. And for serine proteases, we can look at a prototype, a prototype enzyme that behaves as typical as a typical serine protease. And the prototype that we're going to look at is alpha chymotrypsin. Alpha chymotrypsin has 241 amino acids in its polypeptide chain, and it cleaves peptide substrates at a specific location. The substrate selectivity is in an internal position that makes it an endoprotease or an endopeptidase as opposed to an exoprotease which cleaves at the end of the chain. And beyond that it has even more specificity. It will cleave after an aromatic residue. And what does it mean to cleave after an aromatic residue? Well as we're traveling along from the N to C direction, well once we hit the alpha carbon that has an aromatic phenylalanine, tyrosine, or tryptophan residue, then the peptide bond immediately following that is where the cleavage will take place. That's known as the sessile bond. In alpha chymotrypsin, it's the serine 195 group that plays the role of a nucleophilic catalyst. It'll form an intermediate ester group. And there's a couple of other residues that are key. Histidine 57 functions in a, as a base. And that pKa, the pKa of that histidine, is modulated by a closely related aspartate group at 102. That's, those three groups, serine, histidine, and aspartate, come together to what's known as the catalytic triad. Let's take a look at the molecular mechanism. There's the catalytic triad, aspartate 102, histidine 57, and the serine 195, which is going to function as the nucleophile. The bond that we're going to cleave Go ahead and highlight it in your notes. It's that bond right there. And the first step is going to be general base catalyzed nucleophile addition to the carbonyl group of that peptide bond. Those arrows look something like that. Again, notice that we're using the sp2 nitrogen of the imidazole ring of histidine to do the nucleophile addition to the polarized pi bond. That's going to end up making for us the imidazoleum cation. And again, it's the role of the aspartate group with its negative charge to help stabilize that positive charge, making it a stronger base. The, the serine group has added in to make a tetrahedral intermediate at what was the carbonyl carbon. And the oxyanion, the O minus, is stabilized by the amide residues uh, from serine 195 over to residue 193 the glycine NH bond. Those two NH bonds are hydrogen bond donors, and they're pointing right in at that oxy anion to help stabilize that intermediate. The next step is a reverse of the electron flow. So just turn that electron flow right around, and we're going to do a beta elimination. Go ahead and highlight that bond. That's the bond that leaves, and now we're using that imidazoleum group that now has a positive charge as the general acid. So it's a general acid catalyzed beta elimination. And in the, as a consequence, what we end up making is uh, the released peptide amino side of the, uh, the peptide fragment and an ester group. So we've got the imidazole returned to its neutral state. And we have the uh, ester formation between the carbonyl uh, and that serine oxygen atom. So we've got a protein bound intermediate. And that's typical of nucleophilic or covalent catalysis. Here's where water enters in. Water is going to hydrolyze that ester group. We're basically going to repeat that mechanism all over again. But rather than adding in the serine group, we're going to add in a molecule of water. So imidazole is going to, again, function as the general base. We'll make an oxyanion tetrahedral intermediate and an imidazoleum cation, which picks up one of the water uh, protons. The tetrahedral intermediate is formed, and we again have an oxyanion that's stabilized by what known as, what's known again as that oxyanion hole. Finally, what we're going to do is turn the electron flow back around, do a beta elimination, and we now have released the carboxylic acid portion of the substrate. And so we've broken that peptide bond into two, added the elements of water across that peptide bond, and we've returned our residues, our catalytic triad, back to their original form. 
So if we just look at, uh, summarize some of the key things, there's the oxyanion hole that stabilizes the intermediate. Chymotrypsin is very effective at stabilizing the transition state. Even though it's the deprotonation of the serine hydroxyl group it, that forms or that functions as the nucleophile with, with its pKa of that, oxi that uh, hydrogen on oxygen of 16, and it's being deprotonated by histidine, that is quite a weak base to deprotonate such a weak acid, it's able to be stabilized by that aspartate 102 group and help modulate the pKa, making that imidazole ring of histidine a stronger base. To get an idea of the role of that aspartate group, there can be, uh, we can examine a mutant enzyme where we've replaced that aspartate group at 102 with an asparagine group. And if we just look at the relative rates, the wild type, the naturally occurring with the aspartate 102 in place, has a relative rate of 1. 10,000 times slower is the rate where we've made that one atom, oxygen for nitrogen, actually it's three atoms if you count the two hydrogens, but oxygen for nitrogen substitution changes the relative rate by a factor of 10,000. Let's take a look at the structure of this enzyme. So peeking in from the outside, you can see that the active site is pretty much located on the surface of this enzyme. There's the uh, histidine residue. The green is going to be the catalytic triad. When we look at this a little bit closer, you can see the uh, different, there you can three, see all three of the residues that form the catalytic triad. Over here, we can examine uh, a ribbon diagram of that catalytic triad. There's the aspartate group, Right above that is the histidine, and all the way at the top we see the serine. So those three groups are lined up uh, in a row. There's another view. We can look at a couple of different orientations. There you can clearly see all three groups lined up in a row, serine, histidine, and the uh, aspartate group. Here we can see uh, the axianion whole and its relationship to those three groups. At the bottom we have the aspartate, the the imidazole ring of histidine and the serine group, and colored in yellow is the catalytic uh, triad uh, positioned into the oxyanion hole. So in yellow are the two nitrogens that form the oxyanion hole and that will help to stabilize that uh, uh, tetrahedral intermediate. And finally, we can spin that around and zoom in on it, looking at a couple of different orientations. What you can see is that scaffold, that protein scaffold of chymotrypsin, is able to position very accurately the, those groups so that they're just in the right location to bind the substrate and to uh, stabilize that intermediate. Finally, I'll just leave you very quickly with the closely related family of enzymes known as the cysteine proteases. Papain is the prototype that we would study there. And the mechanism is very similar, except that rather than using the serine hydroxyl group, it's a cysteine thiol group. And if you remember, the pKa is for the thiol group is much uh, lower. It's a much stronger acid than is the serine hydroxyl group. And so because of that, there's no longer the need for that aspartate group. And the cysteine proteases function without a catalytic triad. They just have a histidine and a cysteine as opposed to uh, an aspartate, histidine, and serine.